Mike here. Uh, we've got a little new project here. I'm going to try to go over it a little bit. I just finished it. Well, it's not finished yet, but uh, did a lot of work on it yesterday to get it up and running. So uh, we have here's a little uh, modular cooling unit. If you watch some of my other videos, you know a little bit about this system, but this is a new setup. Uh, we have a new fridge. It's a larger mini fridge than the, uh, the old ones, about twice the volume. Um, try to do a little nicer job on this version. We're running R290 in this uh, compressor here. Uh, it was originally an R600A compressor. It's about three and a half cc's. Um, pulls about roughly about 100 watts when it's running. We have an air-cooled condenser there in the back with a brushless DC fan. Uh, run through a filter dryer, capillary tube. We have a heat interchanger there. That large line in the middle is the suction line coming back from the evaporator. Small line is the uh, is the capillary tube, the high pressure. Uh, take a look here inside the unit. That's a brine tank there. It's a uh, six inch third steam table pan um, that contains a solution of propylene glycol and water. Uh, you can see there are those uh, four plastic rods. Those are Delrin, three quarter inch diameter. They are threaded on the top and uh, there's bolts that go down through to support those rods. And then they're grooved there in the edges or in the, in the side there. And then I got some stainless all thread there that tightens everything up and holds them together. The evaporator coil itself sits in this tank here. It's the same coil I used in a previous video. Um, the large coil, um, well, relatively speaking to what I was using previously, it's about 210 inches long. Uh, it's about four inch diameter. Uh, of, of quarter inch tubing. Um, that coil is not supported, it actually just sits in the bottom of the pan. Um, I knew that was going to cause me some problems because uh, it, uh, I don't get some the, the natural circulation I think I was getting with the old uh, bucket, uh, which is, well, it's in there, but anyway, it was supported. Uh, it was hung in there so as it would cool the, the, uh, the propylene glycol solution, that solution would sink and it would get some, some circulation in here. What I'm thinking I'm finding here is even though the level is up around here, I only get frost so high. Now that may also be because the warmest air rises to the top of the refrigerator cabinet, um, but uh, I, I think I'm actually getting some, some issues there where I'm not getting really good circulation. So I'll address that in the future with a uh, oval coil that'll be suspended towards the top of the pan. Uh, the other issue here is I don't have a baffle on this thing yet. Uh, these rods are threaded on the side there and there, quarter inch, and then on the bottom of these rods are threaded quarter inch. I'm going to take a piece of polycarbonate plastic and form a baffle that'll go down the side and then across the bottom, leaving a gap to the wall and a gap to the ceiling to try to get some more air circulation through there. Because it's not cooling the cabinet all that well, and I'm able to cool that, that coolant from, say, 30 degrees Fahrenheit down to 20 in like six or seven minutes. Um, and it's not doing a lot of effective cooling of the cabinet itself. Uh, additionally, I've got glass shelves in this thing, whereas uh, I'm probably going to replace them with wire racks. So, um, sensors I have a um, suction thermocouple there in line. I have a second suction thermocouple in line right there at that T in the center of the frame. Uh, one's before the heat interchanger, one's after. Um, this line, these lines all are going to get insulated eventually. I just um, do this for demonstration purposes. Um, additionally, I have a discharge superheat in line. I have a subcool uh, thermocouple in line. Um, I also have a thermocouple in the bucket of coolant and also one for air temperature. The big exciting thing here is I finally have a temperature controller. Uh, a little Chinese thing, about nine bucks. Works really well. You can set the temperature, you can set the range, you can set a delay start. Um, still have pressure gauges, but rather than just using uh, brass T fittings, I decided to kind of panel mount them a little bit and then ran some capillary tubing. There's the high pressure right there, and uh, there's the low pressure right there. So that gives me some flexibility there. Clean things up a little bit. Uh, power supply there is just for the DC fan. Um, exciting thing, number two, um, is the, uh, the zoom box. Uh, so I can take eight thermocouple inputs and uh, USB connect to a PC. Right now this is actually a Mac, but it's running Windows. Um, so I've only ran this for a little while. Um, it's definitely very interesting already. A um, couple of things to keep in mind, that dark blue line there is the um, 
air temperature inside. The, uh, this lighter blue line there, that's uh, after the heat interchanger. The red line is the uh, before the heat interchanger, the, the, the uh, superheat coming off the evaporator. Um, I can change the time scale and it shows a little more detailed information. Uh, these two lines up here, one of them is ambient air. There's a temperature sensor inside the zoom box and the other one's a subcool one, so they stay pretty close. Um, there's a lighter line there and that's actually the coolant temperature that runs through there. But um, There's more information. I don't have the superheat on here because it'll auto scale and it'll shrink all this information down because uh, the superheat's going to be so high. Um, there's going to be some more temperature sensors in installed once I get the baffle in. Um, and uh, I'll establish the way that I'm going to uh, collect my data and, and, you know, and analyze it and uh, sample rate and all that kind of stuff. So um, I just kind of wanted to do a little brief overview of how the system is set up right now. Um, it still needs a number of things like insulation, the wires need cleaned up, I need to put handles on this thing so I can pick it up because this whole unit does just pull right up out of the top. Uh, but with the coolant in there, it's kind of heavy. So right now I'm just using this little uh, uh, little loop on top of the compressor with a hook and a screwdriver or whatever to just kind of pick it up. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna go over to my buddy's house here and uh, cut the baffle plate and drill the holes and mount that up. And I think that's gonna help matters quite a bit. Um, yeah, so thanks for watching. There'll be many more videos to come. So a couple hours ago, I uh, cut and bent a polycarbonate baffle plate. Uh, so this is uh, several hours before the previous section of this video. Um, I got to say that it was successful. It worked out just as I in had intended. Um, first, I want to share a little bit of the um, observations with the data here. I will uh, eventually collect some data and, and uh, display this a little bit better. Um, but uh, what we have here is the very, uh, the very top line there is uh, pretty much ambient temperature there. It's also the, the subcooling, so that's uh, a lot of subcooling that I'm getting. The yellow line here below, um, there's actually two air temperature sensors in there now. Before there was only one. Um, I'd like to point out this blue one that's just about off the screen now. You can see where it dropped suddenly. That's where I uh, reinstalled that temperature sensor at the bottom of the baffle. So uh, uh, warm air rises to the top of the cabinet, um, goes over the top of the baffle, and then descends uh, is is cooled. So that's uh, the reason that dropped there is because I, I repositioned it. So the yellow one is at the top of the baffle and the blue one's at the bottom. There's usually about you know, 13 to 16 degrees temperature difference between those two values. So I'm doing some, some def definitely doing some air cooling. Um, beyond that, um, you know, this light blue and the, and the red there, those are the two suction um, superheat values. So um, I I just recently adjusted the the temperature the thermostat operates at because I was running about five to yeah five to fifteen degrees Fahrenheit um, and the air temperature is dropping pretty rapidly so I'm going to uh, go ahead and run it probably at the night between ten and twenty so anyway um, <clears throat> you can see the red one that rises that's actually in the cabinet there so it doesn't rise as rapidly to as high a temperature. Um, stays pretty much below the air temperature or, or right about it and then the blue one is uh, exposed to uh, ambient air up here so it's going to warm up a little bit um, but I wanna, what I want to point out here is uh, this recent run here is I don't know eight, eight minutes maybe ten minutes at the most um, you can see the sharp drop in temperature there so the red one uh, it drops down to about where uh, uh, pretty much that saturation temperature for the pressure I'm running at um, the blue one is after the heat interchanger here, so it's going to uh, it's, it's going to be a bit warmer because it's uh, it's being warmed by the capillary tube. Um, if I run this thing all the way down to about five degrees, uh, it'll start to frost up a little bit in the suction line, and then be thawed here, and then it'll start to frost again and be frosty almost the whole way back to the compressor. So um, I can tell that I'm, I'm still I'm pulling them very saturated, very wet vapor back. Um, and uh, so, you know, it, for the charge size right now, it's it's not ideal to run it down to those low temperatures. Um, but you can see that as the runtime, you know, progresses there, the, uh, the, the suction right after the evaporator, but before the heat interchanger, drops pretty quickly down to saturation temperatures. Um, you have to take my word for it. Uh, the blue one there above it, um, 
that is after the heat interchanger and you can see over time it declines in temperature and uh, uh, eventually actually if you see that drop there it completely drops to saturation so that's the point where I'm sucking back so much wet vapor that uh, it's 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 actually passing that second one so it's not being flashed off by the uh, by the heat interchanger by the capillary tube um, and then you can see where I shut it off where the temperatures quickly start to rise and the one after the heat interchanger rises quicker so anyway um, I'm gonna run it overnight between 10 and 20 and uh, observe the cycles tomorrow um, but in the meantime here I'll show you the the baffle there how well you can see that there so it's just a piece of polycarbonate it's bolted to the side and to the bottom there so I'm taking a temperature near the top it's actually back there I need to mount these a little bit better and then towards the exit down there um, just full of beer <laughs> it's the only load I have right now but um, the idea that the idea yeah the idea being uh, warm air rises up over the top of the baffle plate it's cooled by the glycol bucket and then descends down. So um, did a lot of, of cooling today, very low temperature, so I got a lot of frost. So eventually I'm gonna probably shut the thing down and let it uh, warm up and thaw out before I do many more runs, but uh, I'm excited to see what it does overnight and then tomorrow while I'm at work. So should be uh, should be really exciting. So thanks for watching.